All right, howdy everyone, and welcome to the panel on scandals in gaming, addictions, economics, and isms in the entertainment industry. Um, so, I have here with me my colleagues, Shubrilina Deka, the a third year uh, doctoral student and graduate teaching assistant in the Department of Comparative Literature and Intercultural Studies at UGA, the University of Georgia. Um, Dr. S. Satish Kumar, a part-time faculty member at UGA in the Department of Comparative Literature and Intercultural Studies, and the Institute for African American Studies. And I am Andrew Simmons, uh, third year doctoral student, graduate teaching assistant at UGA in the Department of Comparative Literature and Intercultural Studies. So um, we will just get started. Uh, we're going to begin with um, myself and then proceed with Ms. Decca and then finish up with Dr. Kumar. <coughs> And I guess we'll just shoot right into it. So the first paper that we have is Crumbling Empires in the Culture Industry, Immersion, Captivity, and Disenchantment in Entertainment. <clears throat> and, um, well, I guess we'll talk about where exactly the panel came from. Yeah, we first. could do that, yeah. So we, we, we thought about this panel first Last year, actually, as last session of SAMLA was um, either approaching or underway, and uh, we're thinking about... Uh, it was when the theme for the next SAMLA was announced. When the theme for the next SAMLA was announced. And at that time, actually throughout the year 2019, 2019 was essentially the 2020 of gaming, uh, because there were lots of bizarre things going on as far as that goes. So that kind of spawned what this is. So then I'll go ahead and uh, start. <clears throat> the performative world parallel to our own has been a source of human fascination since the earliest recorded works of literature for entertainment. The observation of the inhabitants and their personal and regional affairs of the performative world by ours and of ours by the performative worlds is an ever-changing liminal experience by which the audience and the in unique cases the actors cross over into worlds simultaneously and without consequence to their own we do our best to escape the waking world into play and dream but try as we might the waking world follows us and the dream becomes entangled in reality. This narrative entanglement has been recognized and utilized for millennia, and it's a subject that should be of great concern to the modern public, as more and more literature and play have become unbelievably accessible to actors and audiences of both good and bad faith. <clears throat> Jean-Francois Lyotard wrote in the postmodern condition on the cusp of the explosion of the internet, of questions for the future which required immediate answers. When the distributive potential of information expands as rapidly as was projected in the approach to the 1990s, who permits and prohibits the access of that information and by what authority do they do so? And given that, what sort of effects will this expansion have upon international relations. Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer wrote of a dangerous bourgeois culture industry through which the public are entranced and held captive by entertainment media, particularly television, using as a major example of the encounter Odysseus <clears throat> with the siren song. The answers preferred here in this paper are Lyotard's questions, while nearing resolution, still have yet to be answered, 
to the effect of the dissemination of chaos throughout the modern world, and Horkheimer and Adorno's concerns have recently been rendered less alarming than originally feared, although certainly not obsolete. In the first place, it's good to address the culture industry that Horkheimer and Adorno uh, discuss, and I've partially done this in a previous paper, <clears throat> which I presented last year at SAMLA, called Unassuming Burials <clears throat> on the Performative Burials of Epic Characters in Homer, Virgil, Lucan, and Statius, which made the argument that through animated ekphrastic poetry, including what we might liken to panning and lighting effects in line, the epic poets achieved to varying degrees of form of immersion, which nears perfect in key sections. And this level of immersion in a form of entertainment engenders the fears of Horkheimer and Adorno that by creating and manipulating a captive audience, a cultural elite can affect their optimal desired social circumstances in a sort of post-juvenalian circus or a modern or postmodern siren song. The main issue raised in Dialect of, Enl of Enlightenment, therefore, is a fear that through the subversion of platonic faculties and their subsequent supplementation with highly involved convincing narratives, the public at large might be controlled by an insidious upper class having lost or atrophied their abilities to distinguish themselves in what is truth or to imagine through mental recreation and or representation the true answers to those questions they stumble upon in life. Their argument depends on the ancient siren song of Odyssey Book 12, a thing the experience of which was so divine and otherworldly that it defied description, rendering the potentially promising rapturous section of the already sung epic rather inferior when compared to other sections like the Ekphrases of the Shield of Achilles or the Pen of Odysseus. And in those latter scenes, the very depictions on the items themselves or the memories inspired thereby appear to briefly enter into motion. The best comparison to which I have currently is the uh, in the film, in the 1998 film, The Prince of Egypt, where Moses starts running along the walls and the hieroglyphs. So a modern equivalent to this absorbative experience exists in the products of film and digital entertainment today, and for our purposes in video games. The efficacy of this equivalent, I argue, however, is inferior to the older form. <clears throat> Though similarly effective media do still exist, and actors that are like those demons of Horkheimer and Adorno also do. Since the advent of film, it's been a fascinating fantasy of humankind, or of the human mind, <clears throat> that one might enter into another world via this new televisual technology, uh, which is as real as that which sits daily before our eyes. And this fascination produced stories both marvelous and foreboding, um, including the Philip K. Dick-inspired Total Recall and the more recent novel-turned-TV series, Sword Art Online. <clears throat> and the truest accessible embodiment of these and other stories like them exists in the virtual worlds uh, created by game development companies, <clears throat> which have, in the last three decades, become wildly successful to the point of achieving occasional appointments to televised ESPM time slots. Among the most successful of these are developers who build seemingly limitless worlds, complete with their own legends and mythologies, including the likes of Bethesda and Blizzard Entertainment, now Activision Blizzard Incorporated. <clears throat> and these specifically mentioned, the two above, are famous for their highly devoted followings or fan bases, and recently for the turmoil within those followings. Around the year 2014, the explosive internet foray, now referred to as Gamergate, put video games which were already rapidly growing into their own world recognition as an industry, 
squarely in the middle of an already growing conflict known today as the culture war. And leaving the drama of that event aside for another discussion, <clears throat> the encounter served as a catalyst which began the increasing intercourse of journalistic and social criticism and the gaming industry. And this meeting probably would have occurred in the, occurred in the future regardless, but um, perhaps befell a little prematurely on this particular industry in its growth cycle. The establishment of social politics in the culture of gaming as an important and contested subject set the stage for what would shake the administrative and consumer bodies of Activision Blizzard Incorporated just over five years later, after the development company had become an actor on the world economic stage. So in October of 2019, Blizzard's Hearthstone Grandmasters tournament sent them hurtling into international notoriety when Ng Blitz Chung Wai Chung of Hong Kong used the slogan Liberate Hong Kong Revolution of Our Times in a post-game interview prompting shortly the cutting of the live stream, the suspension of the casters thereon, and a year-long ban and revocation of winnings for the esports player. And this re resulted in a call to boycott the game development company, which was at that time preparing and advertising a major annual convention. Uh, they lost sponsors, including Mitsubishi, whose logo was displayed in the interview, and they garnered responses from United States congressmen <clears throat> on this matter, particularly about free speech. <clears throat> now, Bl Blizzard later did lessen the sentence of Blitzchung uh, to half a year and reinstated his winnings, but the apparent breach of trust remained, while despite J. Allen Brack's insistence that our relationships, quote, our relationships in China had no influence over our decision. The glaring fact remained that according to Slate article, quote, Tencent, the largest Chinese games publisher, owns 5% stake, a 5% stake in Activision Blizzard. <clears throat> the major concern for fans and politicians was, per The Guardian, <clears throat> Quote, American companies like Blizzard are willing to let free speech principles slide when it comes to pro prioritizing big business interests. Democratic, Democratic Oregon Senator Ron Wyden tweeted on that matter that, quote, Blizzard has shown it is willing to humiliate itself to please the Chinese Communist Party. Former World of Warcraft team lead Mark Kern claimed that the Chinese money now dictates American values as well. But given the above, what can actually be said on the matter? <clears throat> the actions of the American company allegedly <clears throat> in line with Chinese interests sparked what can only be described as mass outrage. And whether it's true or not that Chinese money controls the interests of the American company, it became apparent, at least in this situation, that it did not control the values of the American people. And this flies in the face of the misgivings that Horkheimer and Adorno have, at least as entertainment is concerned. Where an immersive experience may be proven especially enrapturing, it's, apparently, it's apparent that where the experience is strongly convincing but temporary, and where the experience lacks an authoritative command of or claim to the truth, the captivation of the audience cannot take place to the effect that they can be manipulated by those who control the narrative. The fast grip upon the mind of the audience that oral epic poetry exerts is made possible by the claim to truth that epic possesses. <clears throat> the probability of even the most thoroughly developed, bibliographically populated fictional narrative can achieve the same level of authority is rather small. More likely it is that, especially given the <clears throat> abolishment of the FCC's Fairness Doctrine beginning in 1987, one of the many mainstream media news outlets, given the assumption of authoritative truth, could most effectively rule the thoughts of the populace in the way that Horkheimer and Adorno suggest. Now, the rule over thought requires that one 
acquire access to the information used by its preferral and its prohibition in order to achieve such a position. And here the work of Jean-Francois Lyotard becomes most important. Lyotard foresaw a time when not only would nation states fight for control over information, just as they battled in the past for control over territory and afterwards control over access to and exploitations of raw materials and cheap labor, and that's on page five, <clears throat> but also foresaw when the possession of authority <clears throat> would become blurred and contested between the nation state and those of the commercial agents and the citizens which reside within. Quote, suppose, for example, that a firm such as IBM is authorized to occupy a belt in Earth's orbital field and launch communication satellites housing data banks. Who will have access to them? Will, who will determine which channels or data are forbidden? The state? Or will the state simply be one user among others? That's end quote. The content already covered in gaming stands rather relevant. Who controls information, in this case speech and narrative, and how do they use it to manipulate those who would access it? Alongside those controversies and intertwined with them are news media and social media politics, which have recently run rampant in the United States, resulting in an alarming mess of the 2020 election cycle, which we're still seeing. The current election cycle, however, is only the culmination of years of bad press and perhaps resultant bad faith. <clears throat> On November 8th, 2019, Mark Tracy of the New York Times published an article that added some fire to the debate already raging over the <clears throat> um, identity of the whistleblower <clears throat> in the Ukraine scandal and whether or not it should be revealed uh, or whether the person still has a right to maintain personal anonymity. According to Tracy, quote, the president and his supporters have argued that the whistleblower should be identified because, they say, his revelations about the phone call between Mr. Trump and the president of Ukraine were politically motivated, while others maintain that anonym an anonymity must be protected, citing, quote, citing safety and deference to the whistleblower statutes, which are designed to encourage people to bring information to light in public interest. <clears throat> Rachel Freitzen of The Hill published on November 13th an article wherein she reports on the particular case of one Cameron Atkinson, a law student who claims to have, quote, tested whether Facebook was blocking posts that mention the name of the whistleblower. <clears throat> Um, there, uh, oh, there it is. That mentioned the name that conservative outlets claim as the whistleblowers. So both journals refer the readers back to the same response by Facebook on the matter, which is, quote, any mention of the potential whistleblower's name violates our coordinating harm policy, <clears throat> um, which prohibits outing of a witness, informant, or activist. And both journals also <clears throat> include the statement by Facebook that, quote, we are removing any and all mentions of the potential whistleblower's name and will revisit this decision should the name be widely published in the media or used by public figures in debate. <clears throat> There's some other journalists, including one Tim Poole, a YouTube-based freelance journalism commentator, disagree with or criticize the above decision, claiming that, quote, Fox News and many outlets have already said the name over and over and over again. Major news organizations have also been heavily scrutinized over the availability and distribution of information, particularly in the case of Jeffrey Epstein, who allegedly committed suicide while awaiting <clears throat> Uh, trial in a high-profile pedophilia case. 
in early November, Project Veritas released a leaked recording of ABC's Amy Robach airing complaints about the news network's <clears throat> uh, questionable handling of the story in yet another case of a whistleblower uh, seeing light in public debate. According to Eric Wimple of the Washington Post, the anchor claimed that the network had suppressed information she possessed on the subject and thus the story was not published at a crucial time. According to Wimple's November 5th article, quote, Robach claimed that, quote, the palace found out that we had her whole allegations about Prince Andrew and threatened us in a million different ways. We were so afraid we wouldn't be able to interview Kate and Will that we also quashed the story. The network statement on the story says, quote, at the time, not all of our reporting met our standards to air, but we have never stopped investigating the story. And Wemple notes that, quote, these are inauspicious times for a large broadcast TV news organization to cite our standards for failing to act decisively on big scoops about malefactors, referencing in particular the uh, in particular relation to the Epstein story, NBC's handling of the Harvey Weinstein story. <clears throat> a, November, a November 12th Washington Examiner article by John Gage says ABC News executives are still working to find out who leaked the video of ABC's new anchor, ABC News anchor Amy Robach, admitting the network spiked allegations of sexual assault by Jeffrey Epstein. An insider at ABC told the New York Post on Tuesday that the company is looking through employees' emails and interrogating staff to figure out who leaked the video. The frantic search includes speculation about the age of the leaker and whether they are an arbitrarily elderly Latin speaker or a younger Harry Potter fan based on the pseudonym of the leaker Ignotus. The ironic pairing of the alleged <clears throat> stifling of the whistleblower's name on Facebook and the desperate hunt for the identity of the entity Ignotus by ABC is indicative of the struggle for control over information by powerful and influential organizations and people, which neither private nor public citizen can seem to escape now. The contest over control of speech and information has created two distinct sides both carrying on with the very same actions which, executed by the other, they decry. There is no way to know what is real. All news is fake news, which simultaneously must and must not be trusted. And the public is left with a conundrum of responsibility and <clears throat> about what stance, if any, should be taken relative to the issues. The last decade has seen an explosive diasporic experience across the internet resulting in interactions once completely unheard of and equally novel confrontations between cultures and demographics. This intermingling brought about the paradox brought the paradoxically taciturn and bombastic highly competitive gaming culture into contact <clears throat> um, or into the realm of social commentary and saw that culture greatly heave within itself <clears throat> and simultaneously cause a tremendous uproar in those which had first contacted it. And Gamergate has proven to be a volatile catalyst to social commentary, leaving us where we stand currently in the most uncertain period of a generation, groping for answers to age-old questions with newfangled concepts. Who controls speech and information and who should and what should and what use should those privileged with such control do with it if anything at all 